Whatever happened to Honest Joe, to Honest Joe Biden? That's a headline. That's actually a headline. Just in early October, a headline from USA Today. What happened to Honest Joe? President Joe Biden's promises are turning into lies. And here's the thing. That's not the only headline out there that's like that. There are plenty more headlines wondering the same question. That's the topic of today's show. Honest Joe Biden, or is it more to truth, dishonest Joe Biden? We're going to look at some of the lies that this administration has told over the last few months. And it's a short show, so we're going to have to cut that list down. We're going to have to pare it down a bit, but we'll get to some of the major ones. And then my guest today, I have a very interesting guest today that has written a book about how to influence people, how to win friends and influence enemies, which ties into this whole question of Joe Biden's truthfulness, his honesty factor, because it it makes you wonder, how indeed can you influence enemies when enemies, when political enemies, for example, are outright liars? I don't know if it can be done, but Will Witt, the author of this book, How to Win Friends and Influence Enemies, Taking on Liberal Arguments with Logic and Humor, and God knows humor helps, right? He's going to be my guest in the second segment. But first up, first up, let me give a heads up to WashingtonTimes.com, particularly for bold and blunt listeners, is offering now a special deal, a 50% off discount for a year's access to the digital platform of the Washington Times. That's all the news, commentaries, and podcasts that the Washington Times puts out there for your benefit to help you discern the truth from the fiction of the fake news media. All you have to do is go to WashingtonTimes.com backslash Cheryl, and that is C-H-E-R-Y-L, type in some info, and boom, you'll have 50% off discount to a year's access of the Washington Times. But wait, there's more. Say you love the Washington Times, you already subscribe, but you want to just get access to What I put out there on the Washington Times, well, there's an easy peasy way to do it. Go to WashingtonTimes.com, find my hyperlinked name, Cheryl Chumley, click on it, scroll to the bottom of one of my pieces, and you will see easy, quick and easy directions on how to sign up for my three times a week newsletter, which contains all my commentaries that I write all week long at the Washington Times, as well as my twice weekly Bold and Blunt podcast, delivered straight to your email box three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Friday and plenty of time to eat your lunch because you know what I know you're a busy conservative that means you're at work and you eat lunch at your desk and you like to read and catch up on news as you eat lunch so why not on Monday Wednesday and Friday click on the special link to my podcast and my commentaries and as you eat you can fill your minds with all the weaponry the mental weaponry you need to fight the far left and you can also you can also pick up Bold and Blunt podcast nowadays at Edify. It's the platform for the faith-based podcasts of the world. The greatest faith-based podcasts in the world are located at Edify. Yes, and Bold and Blunt is among. So check that platform out as well. So speaking of edifying yourself, edifying your soul with the truth, Let's go to the opposite on this and talk about Joe Biden. What happened to Honest Joe? President Joe Biden's promises are turning into lies. This is a piece written by Scott Jennings, October 1st, at Yahoo News, but on the USA Today platform. Well, it's interesting to me because it's not as if Yahoo News or USA Today are right-wing media organizations, right? So what that tells me, when they post a piece like this, the fact is, the truth of the matter is, that Joe Biden's lies, his penchant for lying, his inability to tell the truth, has gotten so disgustingly low, it's gotten so bad that even the mainstream media can't ignore it anymore. It's like the polls. It's like the polls, the political polls during election time, during campaign season. They always, always, always point to the Democrat winning the race. The Democrat candidate could be dead, right? Like Joe Biden practically was. And the polls always point to the Democrat winning. 
And when polls finally squeak through showing that the Republican candidate is actually pulling into a tie or, God forbid, a lead, then those are the polls that you have to look at with some sort of eyes wide open because that tells you that the Republican candidate has surged so far ahead in popularity with the people that even the left-leaning pollsters and the left-leaning pundits who take the polls and twist them for their left-leaning designs, that, that even these people can't ignore the fact that the Republican is coming on strong. Well, that's how it is when you go to a place like Yahoo News or USA Today and you see a headline calling out Joe Biden for his lies. Let me read a little bit from this piece. What did Biden know on Afghanistan? Isn't that the age-old question? What did the Democrat know and when did he or she know it? Apart from his lies, hey, this is a quote. This is a quote. From the writer, apart from his lies about raising taxes and that his $3.5 trillion spending plan costs zero dollars, that's a quick reference to two other lies that this writer already went into in this opinion piece. Back to the piece. Apart from those lies, Biden was badly exposed this week. This is October 1st, remember, regarding his decision on Afghanistan. In August, ABC News's George Stephanopoulos, the great spinmeister under Bill Clinton, that's my edition, not this writer's, but you remember him. He's the guy that invented the spin. George Stephanopoulos, interesting how he went on to the news after his spinmeister career in the White House. I guess the natural next step was a place like ABC News. But anyhow, enough going down the rabbit hole. ABC News's George Stephanopoulos, in an interview with Biden, asked, So, no one told your military advisors did not tell you. No, we should just keep 2,500 troops. That was the quote. What, what it is, a little bit more context, Stephanopoulos is trying to draw Biden out to clarify that, hey, did any of your military advisors tell you we shouldn't just up in the middle of the night, run from Afghanistan and leave all our American citizens and our allies and not tell anybody? We shouldn't just cut and run that maybe we should leave, say, oh, I don't know, 2,500 troops. And here's Biden's answer. Biden said, no, no one said that to me that I can recall. And then here we go, the next line of this piece on Tuesday. During sworn congressional testimony, U.S. Central Command General Frank McKenzie confirmed that he, quote, recommended that we maintain 2,500 troops in Afghanistan, end quote. Lie, 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 lie. That's one of Joe Biden's biggest lies. And it was so bad that even ABC's George Stephanopoulos had to ask questions about it on public TV, publicly watched TV. It was so bad that even USA Today and Yahoo News had to write a piece about it, had to reference it. But look, there's more, there's more than that. The Afghanistan was the biggest, most damaging lie, maybe, that Joe Biden has committed so far. Maybe, maybe, lives lost, that kind of thing, bloodshed, blood on his hands type of lie. But PolitiFact, and I love this, I love this because PolitiFact always goes after conservatives, always goes after like the Trump people and the MAGA people and takes delight in pointing out lies, just the slightest bit of misstep over truth that any conservative, that any Republican, that any Tea Party type makes. And yet here's PolitiFact. PolitiFact has this whole collection of lies that Joe Biden has told. They headlined it, latest false fact checks on Joe Biden. Latest false fact checks on Joe Biden. In other words, they're keeping a running tab on the lies that Joe Biden has told. And really, the running tab has stopped because the most recent one was from Joe Biden, a remark he made on August 20th, 2021, where he said Al-Qaeda is gone, gone in quotation marks, from Afghanistan. Rated false. Another one, July 22nd, 2021, in a CNN town hall meeting, Joe Biden said, the cost of an automobile, it's kind of back to what it was before the pandemic. Eh, false. Rated false. Joe Biden, another statement made on June 23rd, 2021, in a White House announcement. 
Quote, the Second Amendment from the day it was passed limited the type of people who could own a gun and what type of weapon you could own. Eh, false once again. Another lie, a big lie. Another one, Joe Biden stated on May 3rd, 2021, in remarks on the American Families Plan. Here it is. For vaccine rates among Americans 65 and older, quote, there's virtually no difference between white, black, Hispanic, Asian, American, end quote, said Joe Biden. Eh, false. You know what? The list goes on. It's just, it's just this long running list. As, as I'm speaking, my finger is on the down key and the cursor is just moving swiftly and I'm nowhere near the middle of the page yet. Joe Biden stated on September 2nd, 2020, in a speech in Wilmington, Delaware, he says he was the first person to call for invoking the Defense Production Act. Eh, false. Rated false. Here's another one. This one's just ridiculous. I mean, it, it's so see-through. A, a second grader would see this as a lie. Or, or at least a second grader would go, what? Joe Biden stated on t- July 22nd, 2020, in a SEIU roundtable discussion, union discussion. Here's the quote. McDonald's makes you all sign non-compete contracts that you cannot go across town, cannot go across town to try to get a job at Burger King. End quote. It faults. So McDonald's, if you work in, <laughs> if you work at McDonald's, Joe Biden actually said that you have to sign a non-compete clause so that you can't go work for Burger King during a certain amount of time period after exiting McDonald's stage left. Why just Burger King? Why not Wendy's? I mean, doesn't Wendy's compete with McDonald's and Burger King as well? Why, why, why not any other fast food restaurant? Why not Taco Bell? Can you go to Taco Bell? I guess you can go to Taco Bell, but you can't go to Burger King. Joe Biden, a statement, July 22nd, 2020, in a town hall. No U.S. presidents, no U.S. presidents elected before Donald Trump were racist. Eh, rated false. Joe Biden stated on May 21st, 2020, in a video, you weren't allowed to own a cannon during the Revolutionary War as an individual. Eh, false once again. And let's just do another since we're on May, May 22nd, 2020, in an interview on the Breakfast Club radio show, Joe Biden says, quote, the NAACP has endorsed me every time I've run. Eh, false. Look, I'm still pushing the button, still pushing the button. We're getting now maybe three quarters of the page down, but it's just a running PolitiFact list. PolitiFact, from the Pointer Institute, by the way, again, not a right-wing conspiracy website, not a right-wing conspiracy media outlet, a running list of Joe Biden lies, rated outright false, and only going back to August. I mean, my goodness, if you had to include Afghanistan on this page, if PolitiFact had include Afghanistan on this page, they probably would have had to start a whole new website just based on that. So here's the thing. How do you, as, say, an American citizen who cares about the state of the Constitution and the fate of individual liberties in this country and the politics and the economy and the culture and society and the moral compass and all those great things that lead into American exceptionalism, how do you, as an individual, get along with a liar, right? Somebody who represents in the opposite party, in the opposing political party, who pretends, who feigns, who acts as if he or she cares about the same things that you do in America, but spends all his or her time lying. How do you sit there and seriously have a civil discussion and come to consensus about some of the issues facing this nation? If the person that you are having a discussion with about a matter of importance to this nation's fate, if the person you are discussing that matter with is an outright known outed liar, how can you come to consensus with that person? How can you reach an agreement? How can you coordinate, collaborate, come to some sort of agreement on how to go forward in partnership, in unity, in unity for the good of the nation. I just don't see it. 
I guess the takeaway is this. We may not be able to, on the right side of things, influence this administration, this president, and this White House with facts, with moral arguments, with pleas for the good of the nation's constitution and individual liberties, with historical truths, but we may be able to at least maintain a sense of humor over the many, 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 many endless lies that this administration tells and then honestly thinks it gets away with. So Will Witt, Will Witt is my guest today. He's going to talk about how to win friends, influence enemies, taking on liberal arguments with logic and humor, may not work on the lying liars in the White House and in this administration and on President Joe Biden himself, but maybe it'll work on some other people out there who are on the sidelines or in the crossroads or straddling both sides or uncertain about which direction to take. This is where this skill set comes in handy. So thank you, Will Witt. Thank you for being on Bold and Blunt. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. So tell me about this new best-selling book you have out, How to Win Friends and Influence Enemies, Taking on Liberal Arguments with Logic and Humor. Do liberals have senses of humor? You know, it's hard to say if they do. I think that I just see so many conservative books out there, and they really are about hey, here's what's wrong with America, here's why the left sucks. And I really wanted to give people more of the solution, right? I wanted people to know that there are ways that we can actually talk to people to change people's minds. You know, I've gone and done thousands of different videos and talked to hundreds of different people and have changed a lot of minds just by using the strategies that I put out in the book. So that's really what I wanted to give to people so that we can actually have good conversations because all it is nowadays is just, screaming at each other and nothing ever gets done. Yeah, that, that's exactly true. And it wasn't the, even that long ago where we could have differences of opinion and they were regarded with interest, not with violence and hatred. I don't know if you remember, but uh, Sean Hannity used to have the Sean Hannity, Alan, Alan Combs show, right, on Fox News, where they presented the left and right side on, all in one show. Types of discussions like that are long gone, it seems, though. Yeah, I mean, look, we used to have unsafe spaces. Those were places where people with all sorts of different ideas would come together and find out which idea is the best, right? That's how, that's how you tested the validity of an idea, that it could stand the test of being put up against other ideas. But nowadays, it's like, oh, if you don't have the exact same opinion, then you should be shamed and ostracized and, and cancel culture on social media. I mean, all it does is exacerbate that problem. So I, I think it's a huge deal because it makes it that, new ideas, novel ideas, things that might be worthwhile listening to, never reach the forefront because everyone's too worried about what people will think about them instead of actually putting out differences of opinion. And what I like about what you do, because you and I spoke maybe, I, I don't know, it's been a long time, maybe a year ago, uh, but you talked to, uh, to me before about how you would approach the ideas of socialism on college campuses to get these young people to understand that socialism would really be a disaster to America. But you did it in a, in a way that was so unhostile. It, it was the opposite of hostile. And I think you draw a lot of people to the side of reason and rationale by doing that that way. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. I mean, look, I figured that if I go up to someone and I start getting mad at them or trying to shame them or tell them how dumb they are because they believe in socialism, it's like, that's not going to do them very, very much good, you know? So I think that the most important thing that we do when we're going and talking to people is having compassion. You know, I was someone who was on the left, was a leftist atheist my entire life, and the reason why I am where I am now is because people actually talk to me in a good conversation, not because someone put me in, like, a owning the lives video, you know? <laughs> so I, I think it's important that, that we keep our heads on when we're talking to people and say, hey, how would I want to be treated if I was going to talk to this person? 
So that's interesting that you say that you used to be leftist atheist, because I also used to come from the far left camp, uh, born and raised to Democrats in, in the liberal loon land of Massachusetts, and I was atheist as well. And my conversion, I guess, so to speak, was just what you described. It was just rational discussion with others. Now, do, do you remember who exactly influenced you the most in your change of heart and mind from um, atheism and liberalism? Yeah, I mean, I think the number one person, I'm not just saying this because of Frager, you really is Dennis Frager. I mean, Dennis Frager was the guy who talks more about common sense and talks more about values than he does about politics. Because honestly, the more I've been doing this, I've been in, in this world for about four years, you find that a lot of the political stuff comes and goes, the new stuff comes and goes, but the, the values ideas that, that Dennis talks about really were influential to me, you know, because, again, when I was on the left and, and atheist, I mean, I was living my life in a totally different way, in a, well, you could maybe say a moral way, and so the, the good values that Dennis Prager preached about really just changed my entire life, so I thank him every day for that. So how do you approach others in the younger generation, which I, I guess is your generation, though, who are, who, who are being polled on almost a weekly basis about how much they embrace socialism over capitalism? Well, I think that you have to start with the incentives that people have and come to these people and level with them. You know, I understand why so many people believe these things in America nowadays, right? Like the, the price of health care has exponentially gone up price of housing has exponentially gone up, um, the price of education has. So these people are in debt. Seventy percent of millennials are living paycheck to paycheck. So when that's happening, of course they want to turn to socialism. It's hard to have personal responsibility when you have all this massive debt that is, you've now incurred. And so I think it's about first defining the terms with people. You need to understand what they believe capitalism is and what they believe socialism is. And then once you do that, it's about asking the right questions. It's about asking the questions about, hey, do you know um, about these countries that have tried socialism before and how they fail? Do you know what the DMV is? Do you think that the, our healthcare system should be ran by the DMV? And, and getting in like that, and, and if you can weave the facts into your questions, then you're going to have a really good time talking to people. Because at the end of the day, it's not necessarily you changing their mind. It's them changing their own mind because they can't answer the questions that you present them. So do you think, if you're somebody who watches news, right, what you see on the news is just the, the far left loons on the left and young people screaming down anybody with alternative viewpoints that don't meet the narrow confines of the left and, and so forth. But you're out there every day talking to these people. Is the media painting the youthful left in the right picture or are they only showing the, the looniest of the loons? So should we be more optimistic than we are about America's youth? That's a very big question. Uh, I will tell you a few things. First, I'm on my book tour right now, and I actually spoke at University of Maryland the other day, and I have about 50 protesters who come out to protest my event. And I go up to them, and I say, hey, I'm sure that the, the left has said some lies about me, you've heard, and I'm sure the conservatives might have said some lies about you guys. So why don't we have an honest discussion and, and see where we can come to some common ground or maybe work this out? And what do they do? They screamed obscenities at me, <laughs> me I was a racist and a liar. They, they refused to talk to me. I said, come to the event. I said, come to the event and ask questions. Not one of them came. And so I understand that it's, it's easy to kind of look on Twitter and everything and say, wow, these young people, like, so many of them are dumb, but maybe it's just in a vacuum on social media. But in reality, I mean, I, I think that it is really true. I think that what the universities, Hollywood, the mainstream media, the corporate special interests, what they have done to the youth in this country is is evil. There really is no other word around it because it is immoral and it is evil. And it has turned people against each other. Wow. So how do you counter that when you, when you have a group that just, uh, they don't want to listen? It, do, do you kind of dismiss them? There's no way to reach these people. Are they the lost? That's a good question. You know, I, I can't necessarily say that they're lost because, like, the girls who I do my show with, I'm not sure if you have seen her on Frasier Her name is Amala. Yes. And she used to be so far on the left. She has a Black Lives Matter fist tattoo on her arm, right? <laughs> and now it's funny because sometimes on our show I'll have to be like, hey, Amala, you can't be that conservative. <laughs> <laughs> like, any, anyone can, I, I think that anyone really can change. I, I have no doubt about that. But 
Because the thing, I'm a big fan of Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, and if you know what he talks about, he talks about a herd morality, and that when people get into large groups of people, they are very dumb, and they seek solace in, in the herd and being in the majority. And so I think that when you have large groups of people like that, it is nearly impossible to change people's minds, but if you can, again, get people in individual conversations, then I think you can be very successful. I think that's a really good point. Yes. Um, do, do you think the right does a good enough job of selling the dream uh, of America? It, you know, the, the stuff that people dream of at night when they lay in bed, right? They, they don't dream of becoming socialists or, or part of the collectivist state. They have individual dreams. Do you think conservatives do a good enough job of selling the idea of how America can bring those dreams to reality? No, not at all. I don't think so at all. I, I think that conservatives and Republicans are doing and have done a terrible job in connecting with young people nowadays. And I, and I don't necessarily think that it's like, let's make conservatism cool. You know, I, I don't even think it's that for connecting with young people. I think it's more just giving young people the reasons why having a, a, a family and being responsible for yourself and, and knowing that hardships don't require the government to always help you. You can do things on your own. Like, you have to make people realize that these sorts of things actually are better for them. But I don't think the GOP has done that. I think the GOP is focused on old, stale talking points that maybe affect the 80-year-olds in their party. Yeah. And I, I think that there needs to be a massive rebranding. And that's what I did in the last chapter of the book, A Vision for America. I, I, I basically laid out how we can change America and make it a much better place. Without, without giving it away too much, how, how do you... How do you go about changing America and making it a better place? Yeah, there are a few things I focus on. The first two things that people need to focus on is first, uh, God. That's the number one thing that yep. I don't think can be sacrificed. Because even if you are an atheist, you can look at how this country was founded and know that the Founding Fathers gave us inalienable rights and doubt on inspired creator. So yep. that's the first thing. Second thing is, is bringing back family values and incentivizing people to have families and, and not be you know, uh, dependent on the state or dependent on whoever else for those types of values, because then kids aren't growing up with any shared value system as their, as their parents. Um, after that, you go into the education system, and that should be the number one thing that outside of ourselves, I think we are really focusing on, because it doesn't matter if we have a, a president who agrees with us, House Senate, news media that agrees with us. If the next generation is just going to school and getting brainwashed again, then it, it doesn't really matter, right? Because they just come out the exact same. And then after that, we have to focus on the culture. We have to focus on the culture and make sure that we can actually get into places like Hollywood and publishing and all sorts of things like this so that we can influence a lot of people. Now, I'm glad you brought up and I'm glad you listed as number one about God because that is the DNA of America and the idea of God-given rights. Uh, it's not just a blessing, but it carries the responsibility that citizens have to be godly, right? But our nation is, at the same time, embracing more socialism. It's also turning more secular. So how do you, <laughs> how do you fight that? Yeah, that's a very good question. It, it's, it's really tough, I will say, because, again, it's like you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. You know, I think I, I got baptized nine months ago, and so oh, wow. that was a... Yeah. That's a big deal. It was a, yeah, it was a huge deal. I mean, the biggest thing in my life. But, you know, that was a conviction inside of me that after reading the Gospels, I said, wow, if this is really true and Jesus Christ really died for our sins like this, then I have no other choice but to give my life to Him. Right? And so it's, it, it, that is something that is incredibly difficult to try and spill on somebody else, I think. I think that's very hard. But I think that regardless of, again, whether people are atheists or Christian or Jewish, whatever, I think that everyone can realize that the Ten Commandments, if everyone in the world followed them, the world would be a much better place. And I think atheists would agree. I think that they would agree the exact same way. And so I think just at least giving people an understanding of what is in Scripture and, 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 and the Word of God, I think that, again, even if they remain atheists, the values that resonate in will hopefully change America to be a better place again. All right, so last question, because I know you got to go, but if people just want to get a quick takeaway of why they should buy your book, what, what's in there that people can use pragmatically to put into practice right now? Let's say you're at your college class or you're at your work or maybe you're at Thanksgiving dinner and your 50-year-old aunt who never got married is 
is, is trying to talk to you about climate change. My book essentially gives you everyone who's listening the tools that they can go out and say, actually battle against these things. And I know how to do it in a good way. You know, I'm sure that many people who are listening say, well, I know the facts about climate change. I know the facts about racism, but that doesn't mean that we all know how to ask it in the right way. You know, and that's not me saying that I'm perfect with everything I've done. You guys will see the book. And if you're batting 500, you're having a pretty good day. But the tools and strategies, the asking questions and the practice that you can get from it is going to be monumental in your journey to, to going into your communities and actually changing the culture. Because right now, the right's getting more right, the left's getting more left, and until we can come together and actually talk, I mean, it's just going to continue to get worse. Yep, and there your book is in the middle, bridging both sides. So, How to Win Friends and Influence Enemies, Taking on Liberal Arguments with Logic and Humor. The recently baptized Will Witt. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I love being on. And there you have it, the next episode of Bold and Blonde. I hope you were able to catch most of Will's remarks. I caught up with him at the airport, uh, so you could see, you could hear anyhow that the sound quality wasn't the greatest. But he's a tough guy to schedule. He's all over the country right now promoting his book, but he's been all over the country anyhow. He visits college campuses through Prager University, through his affiliation with Prager University. He goes to various college campuses, and he puts himself out there to reach out to the young people of America, the very ones who are embracing socialism with alarming frequency, and he engages them in discussions to determine A, why they embrace socialism, B, what they know about socialism, and C, ultimately to inform them how socialism is so, oh, so destructive to America. And in so doing, he actually influences these young people and helps change their minds. So it's a great way to train the next generation in the way to go. Not by screaming at them, not by protesting them, not even by putting them down and calling them ignorant, which, you know what, I myself am, am guilty of. I do sometimes call people who seem to me to be ignorant as ignorant. And ignorant, by the way, is not a sign of intelligence versus non-intelligence. It's not an IQ standard. It's basically whether you're informed on an issue versus uninformed. Formed. The smartest people in the world can still be ignorant. And unfortunately, that's how I see so many of today's youth because they're not being taught first by parents and they're not being taught second by the school system. And thirdly, they're actually being infiltrated by far leftist forces who want to steal their minds and their ability to critically think and feed them propaganda that makes them good, obedient, communist sheep. So here comes Will Witt in the midst of these wolves and he teaches them gently through the art of persuasion, the long lost art of persuasion, why they're wrong and why American exceptionalism is indeed American exceptionalism. Thank you for listening. Don't forget Bold and Blunt is available on Edify, E-D-I-F-I, the platform for faith-based podcasts. You can get Bold and Blunt there, but you can check out tons, scores, plenty of other podcasts with faith-based messages to, guess what, edify you, to buoy your spirit through these dark times. So check out Edify. Go to WashingtonTimes.com, subscribe to my three times a week newsletter, click on my Bold and Blunt podcast and catch up with the episodes. And as always, if you are a regular listener, if you are a, are a subscriber to my newsletter, I want to thank you for your support. I really do appreciate it. And so does the team at the Washington Times. Again, thank you for listening. Tune in next time. And in the meanwhile, you know the deal. Stay blunt, stay bold.